and welcome back everyone to the Guidewell Insights Lounge. My name is Kate Warnock and we're here at day two of Singularity University's Exponential Medicine. We have with us a very distinguished guest, Mr. Brad Templeton. Brad, welcome to the interview. Great to be here. Brad was one of the opening keynotes because he is the track chair for information technologies at Singularity University. Brad, I was hoping that you could maybe give us a recap of the keynote that you gave yesterday. Well, it's important just to understand that the reason medicine is going exponential is because of computing in the largest way. I mean, computing is the technology that first taught the world about how to really be exponential information is that technology. And it's slowly making its way in to take over all the other industries and medicine is very high on the list. So I looked at a lot of different new trends, some of the hottest trends going on in computing to help people understand what it might mean for the whole world as well as for medicine. Uh, beginning with things like looking at the world move from being a hardware-based economy to a software-based economy and understanding that everyone, even including medical companies, now have to be more about software than they are about the physical things that they built. Only this gives you the flexibility to survive in a world where everything is changing exponentially and you can't make plans for 2025 anymore with the knowledge of 2015. You have to make them with the knowledge of 2024. And <laughs> software is the only way that you can be flexible enough to do that. I talked about all the things that are going to want to bring us lots of bandwidth. All of these technologies are going to want networking all around the world. Um, there's lots of projects going on to make that happen. The existing bandwidth technologies we have are getting faster. People are putting balloons and drones in the air to bring connections all around the world, not just to the rich people in the world, but every single person is going to have access to a data connection, which is going to make a difference for their health. Um, I looked at augmented and, and um, virtual reality technologies which are, of course, already exciting people for entertainment and new ways to interface with computers. They'll be changing how doctors interact with patients. They'll be changing how surgeons perform procedures when they can have something that almost looks like an x-ray in front of their eyes. They can be Superman right. seeing inside the body. There can be all sorts of great applications for that. Um, people are already using it as well to train doctors and to uh, help improve the quality of care. I talked about... Um, this phrase we call the Internet of Things. Now it's, um, it's a bit of a marketing term. There isn't an Internet of Things that you can go and connect up to. Rather it's trends in a lot of technologies that are getting smaller and cheaper and lower power. And everything that used to be expensive is becoming cheap. And so we're seeing that in medical devices and wearables. So there's a lot of different things going on. No one overriding theme yet, just a lot of interesting little projects. We touched a bit on digital currency. Uh, and then I went into the thing that I'm working on now, so it's my current passion, which is vehicles that drive themselves. And people have been hearing about this a lot in the press. Google making a car. I worked on that car for a couple of years. Several other companies doing it. Uh, what many people don't realize is that auto accidents are one of the leading killers in the world, certainly one of the leading causes of traumatic injury in the world. 1.2 million dead every year. $870 billion of cost in the United States every year from auto accidents. We hope to bring that down to maybe as low as a tenth of what it is today. That's like curing almost anything but cancer and heart disease in terms of the positive effect on society and the reduction in medical treatment and work in the ERs and lifelong wounds. So that's going to be quite dramatic. But another aspect of the technology I'm working on is to make it smaller and make boxes that can drive themselves, which is to say delivery robots. Huh. They'll bring you anything in 30 minutes, not just a pizza. Uh, they'll bring you your pharmacy order, they'll bring you uh, groceries, um, they'll bring you food and they'll bring you uh, stores, stuff from stores. They might even someday bring you medical diagnostic equipment. So the doctor who can visit you by video or virtual reality will also be able to send a test machine to you which could give him the results. So we might actually see something like the house call that I'm old, so when I was a child, this will shock all the younger viewers. The doctor actually came around and visited you when you were not feeling very well. Well, that may not happen with a physical doctor, but we may be able to get personal care outside of hospitals as medical equipment and emergency equipment gets to move quickly and cheaply. Um, hospitals are actually terrible places. You get sick in them. I've had two relatives lose limbs from hospital-acquired infections, eventually leading to the end of their lives. Um, I'm not alone. It's huge thing and I would like to see an ability to have medicine be distributed and computers and robots are going to make all this happen. All right Brad, so you describe a future that just sounds 
uh, almost alien, you know, with as, as game changing as this technology is going to be. Are we going to see this implemented in the next two to three years? Or are we looking at this more of a 10 year arc that you just described? Well, I described a lot of different technologies. So uh, some of them are coming to you very soon. Some of them are already here in the room we're filming in. Um, some of them will take uh, 10 years to, to really start getting into large numbers, although very early on in their adoption, even when they're young, they'll start changing the debate right away. Um, people ask me about this with cars, and I say, how many of the cars on the road are Uber? Well, less than 1%. But that's already changing all the talk about transportation and how people use it. And the same will be true as these technologies move into our lives, into healthcare. You know, so as closely as you watch trends and as expert as you are in, in, um, in this field, is there a new innovation that you see having, the, what is going to have the biggest impact on the future of the health industry? Hmm, well, I'll go to something entirely different, although it's a dream I have rather than something that is really going to happen. But I would love to fix the drug approval process. <laughs> and okay. uh, everyone would love to fix the drug approval process. And one thing that I think might be nice if people could realize, that process was designed in the middle of the 20th century, or as we like to say, back in the 1900s, because that sounds much, much more older, in the past. <laughs> and it was designed before we knew about smartphones and computers and low-cost medical sensors, um, and the ability to send information in real time from everybody to everybody. And today, we could do drug trials where Everyone has a smartphone, the doctors, the patients, everybody has one of the winners of the Qualcomm Tricorder X Prize that's measuring their vital signs. Um, you would know immediately of adverse effects, the, the constant communication between experimenters, doctors, patients. We could design a completely different and much faster process. In Silicon Valley, a lot of people have become interested in doing health startups, and many of our students at Singular University have. And whenever I ask them, what are you doing? They always say one very important phrase. Well, we're trying to make sure this is not a diagnostic device or a medical treatment. Because if we do that, we're dead in Silicon Valley where results are measured in months, not decades. But isn't that sad that they're all saying, I've got to find some way to think this is not a diagnostic device. It's, it helps a doctor or it gives you, you know, nutrition advice or something like that. Um, it's kind of like the supplement boom, because once it was a supplement, you could get past that process. Well, the FDA and governments around the world should wake up and understand the technologies we have today, not the ones of the future, but the ones we have now, could change how medicine is developed, and that would really benefit everybody even more, and I, this is a rare thing for me to say, but even more than stopping car accidents will, uh, even though that involves millions of deaths. I think it's even bigger. You know, well, again, I know that the mission of Singularity University is really to address the world's biggest challenges. So do you have the right people to work with to really influence the policy that might really enact the change that you want to see in the FDA and other global yeah, entities? Yeah, I hope so. I mean, we, uh, we have programs on a regular basis. People come in, including people from various levels of government, and, uh, and they're starting to think about it. Uh, you know, we often vilify the government for slowing things down and sometimes with good reason we vilify them but of course the people there are actually uh, hard-working people who really do want to see the system improve as long as they believe they can maintain the safety that they maintain right. and um, I think just making them more aware of what could be done what the technologies are capable of doing uh, the other thing of course that's very exciting and I'm sure you've been talking about with other guests is uh, what's going on in bioinformatics and genomics and uh, the ability of computers and the new modeling systems we have, the neural network systems, to understand the genome and individualize our medicine. It's all driven by computers again, and I'm also very excited about that. Excellent. Well, Brad, another passion point that I think that you've expressed, it's about privacy in the internet age. What is it that the healthcare industry can learn from the internet? It is very challenging. I think it's pretty clear that HIPAA did not make the healthcare system better. Uh, well-intentioned, right. but uh, unfortunately this happens a lot. Uh, it's very difficult to regulate privacy. One of the biggest problems is that most people don't care about their privacy until after they've seen an invasion. Right. Um, and so as privacy advocates, we have a hard time getting actually the public and even lawmakers to understood, understand the important roles of privacy and how to protect it. Uh, one thing that's become very clear, though, is that if you don't design the privacy in something from the beginning, it doesn't happen. 
Um, and it's true in the online world, it's true in the medical world. So you have to actually do have to think about it when you're getting going. And also, you maybe want to look at ways that the distributed technology we have today could help people be stewards of their own data, not, in, not to monetize it, right. but just so that they can be sure that it's only being used in the ways they want. And, and the hard part is trying to figure out a way to do that while still making it very easy to use and right. easy to access, but giving people the control so that all of their personal medical details are not spread out to the world. And if they want to contribute their data for research, that they can do it in a way that makes them feel comfortable, that um, you know, it won't expose them to problems later on. Well, I've unfortunately just stated the problem for you. I haven't stated the solution. There's a reason for that. The solutions are hard and they're individual and specific to the different problems. But the underlying philosophy of thinking about it in advance, designing it, understanding that sadly, data given away is almost always repurposed for something you didn't like, uh, trying to figure out how to make it happen. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this is a strange thing for a privacy advocate to say, but there is a lot of very useful medical knowledge that could be garnered from some of the data that we want to keep private. Now, we've tried very hard, in many cases, to try and make data anonymous. Unfortunately, we almost always fail. It's a very difficult challenge to make data truly anonymous, and people have shown how difficult it is. So one of the great challenges that which should be addressed is making ways to make it easier for people to participate in research and help research, but still have a comfortable level of privacy. That's the holy grail I'd love to see achieved. So let me ask you, related to that, National Institutes of Health obviously has started their personalized medicine initiative based on you know, Barack Obama's call for, I don't know that it was Barack specifically, but um, that million person cohort, a research cohort um, for, uh, for precision medicine. Do you think that the NIH is, is maybe going to help break through uh, and, and really, hopefully, make sure that that data is protected, but make the average individual, the average consumer, feel more comfortable about participating in something like that. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the specifics of their efforts, so I can't give direct comment on that. I can say that they're, in the mathematical and cryptographic world, we've actually done a lot of research on ways to allow you to do computation on data without compromising the data, and it's used a little bit in banking uh, and a few other things like that. Uh, it could be that uh, these efforts, if they looked into what's possible in cryptography so that the data is kept by stewards who can be trusted and have motives only to protect the data, right. um, who can then allow the operations to take place. In fact, I often say that we made a bit of a mistake when we went to the cloud and the web, which is now all of our data goes up to the servers of the companies like Facebook and Google and Yahoo that we work with. And in the old days, we kept data on our own computers and the software came to our computers. Right. Today, the software is on the company computer and our data goes to the company computer and it leads to bad results sometimes. I'm looking for something in between where we could have data live in machines that are responsible to us, but which allow, in restricted ways, researchers and people who we need to grant permission to and our healthcare providers and everyone else to get limited access to it, which can be given and revoked uh, but it's, very, it's got to be very easy to use for us and for them. If we can build that, maybe we can find the middle ground we're looking for. Terrific. Well, one more question for you, Brad. From your perspective, are we in the midst of a healthcare renaissance? Oh, I don't think anyone would say other than that today. Um, I think what's going on in genomics is going to just be absolutely astounding. We're going to really learn, uh, and all the omics, uh, uh, we're going to learn you know, the secret of life itself. I mean, I, I know we said we found that when the DNA structure was discovered, but I think we're going after the real thing now. Um, I think we're going to be able to tailor therapies and medicines for people individually based on that. Uh, we're going to have the data from all sorts of advanced scanning equipment, and uh, I think we're just going to have a tremendously better ability to treat people if we can find a way that people can innovate quickly and not have to wait eight years to make it available to patients. Right. Uh, uh, then it will be, well, the Renaissance actually happened over centuries, and that's too slow for me. So I hope we're not in the Renaissance. I hope we're in something far beyond the Renaissance. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, with those words, Brad, thank you so much. I really appreciate the perspective that you shared with us here at the Guidewell Insights Lounge. My name is Kate Warnock. We'll be up soon with another interview. Please join us again. Thank you very much. Thank you.